We're going to give you everything we can on uh, ethics this year, uh, titled Roulette, because obviously with that song, if you're familiar with Kenny Rogers, The Gambler, uh, pretty appropriate. Know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. You'll see that theme throughout today as we talk about specific cases. We'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the stats, we'll call it the game, and the lessons learned. We'll ha hopefully be a little interactive with you all. Uh, we'll ask for your participation to try to make ethics lively, as lively as it can be. So uh, bear with us as we go through. I'm going to give you a little bit of the stats to begin with, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dan to go through some of the lessons in the game, and then I will pick it up again. So we'll tag team a little bit. Uh, part of the game is understanding odds. If you're a gambler or you know gambling, if you've been to Vegas, uh, it's understanding the odds and playing the odds. Most great gamblers don't blindly bet on something without knowing there are odds. So just as gamblers do, lawyers sometimes take gambles. And so the question for today as we go through some examples are what are the odds? What should I do? Do I take an offer? Do I walk away? Uh, or do I fight it? And so part of the understanding of the game is knowing what the odds are. So let's talk a little bit about the stats. And you know, the question is, is what choices do you have? Well, before you make a decision, like I mentioned, you should know the odds. Are the odds stacked against you? Uh, what's the facts? What's the likelihood, the scenario? It's very similar to what we do in family law. Our clients will ask us repeatedly, well, am I gonna win? Am I gonna get the house? Am I gonna pay maintenance? Well, there are odds, right? The most likely scenario is this. The least likely scenario is this. I can't tell you exactly, just like betting. No one's gonna tell you the winner, presumably. So let's go through briefly some of the stats that'll give you some perspective, not only for yourself, but again, the odds. So there were 1,723 complaints of attorney misconduct in 2015. 694 of those were formally opened as investigations by the OCDC. 438 cases were investigated by the Regional Disciplinary Committee. And if you're not familiar with that, I didn't, they're not on this, and I added some stats just to give you some more perspective. There's like a Region 10 disciplinary committee that's impaneled to handle other issues similar to the OCDC, and they can refer it to the OCDC. So in our region, Region 10, St. Louis County, there were 169 investigations in 2000, and I think it's 17. Of those 169, 24 admonitions and 20 guidance letters. So of the 169 investigations, only 14% of those matters that were opened were actually investigated with an, and then concluded with an admonition. Of those 169, I mentioned 20 received guidance letters. So think about only 26% of the time, region was doing something about the investigation. So you wanna ask yourself, are those good odds? 256 cases were investigated by the OCDC, referred from the regional disciplinary committees, all of them. 49 cases were placed in the informal resolution program. 909 complaints and investigations were not opened. 36 of those didn't have enough information to proceed. 16 were referred to fee dispute, because think about if you've ever been the subject of a client complaining about your fees, the fee dispute resolution program. 19 were placed on inquiry status. So here's some of the summary of the discipline that the OCDC took. Again, we mentioned of the, of the title, or the Region 10, only 169 investigations. 23 lawyers were disbarred. 25 were suspended, four of those which were stayed, and they were placed on probation. 
and 90 lawyers received written admonitions. So I, I dug a little bit as I looked at some of these stats trying to get some perspective of the odds. Anybody have any idea how many lawyers are in the state of Missouri licensed to practice law right now? Just to shout out a number. Say it loud. 20,000? What else? Seven. So there are 24,922. Good guess. That's right. Come on up. So think about that as a percentage of the matters investigated. Let me go back real quickly. Of the 1,723, let's say 694 formal investigations. Of, so there are 25, just call it 25,000 lawyers. 2.78% of the population of licensed attorneys had open investigations. 2.78, not very many. Odds seem to be in your favor, right? Maybe. Depends on the facts. Depends on what's offered. 98 investigations of overdraft notifications on trust accounts, which that number surprised me a little bit. I expected it to perhaps, or even you'll see later, safekeeping of property. I expected that number to be bigger. I, I've always mentioned, even to younger lawyers, there are a lot of things you can do and you can mess up, either in family law or just as a practicing lawyer and still keep your license. One of them is a no-no, and that is messing with clients' money. Forget about it. That's gone. I mean, if you mess with clients' money, expect a severe result. So that's why I actually expected a much higher number of investigations. But what it does say is we're doing a really good job of safekeeping clients' property. I, mean, I almost think you could probably murder someone. As long as you weren't messing with their money, you get to practice law. <laughs> Eight lawyers received public reprimands, which is a very small number. 134 guidance cautionary letters were sent to lawyers. And basically it's, hey, here's a warning sign. We see this as an issue, not so much as of a level of reprimand, an ethical violation, but it's something if it happens again, you're in trouble. So let's go through what created the most violations in the top 10. And you probably, anybody have a guess as to what number one would be? You've probably seen it already. Yell it. Not trust account, surprisingly, right? Communication. Keeping the client advised, right? Talking to the client. So let me read this to you. Rule 4-1.4. A lawyer shall. That's not a lawyer should. A lawyer might. A lawyer could. First tenant of, if you want to train a young lawyer, a lawyer shall keep the client reasonably informed about the status of the matter. Promptly comply with reasonable requests for information. And consult with the client about any relevant limitation on their con the lawyer's conduct when the lawyer knows the client expects assistance not permitted by the rules. I mean, has a client ever asked you to do something you can't do? My favorite is, I'm going to hide this property. What should I do and how should I do it? I get it all the time. So one of the things we do that we instituted a long time ago at Cordell & Cordell was keeping the client advised in writing. We used to do it weekly, bi-weekly, and you should send it to them and, and sell, them, or sell it to them by saying, look, you're going to get tired of getting a written update from me. Sometimes not much is going on, but trust me, you're going to want to know what's going on because I always say this, if you had cancer or if you were waiting for a blood test, for a serious medical problem, took a month to go by and you heard nothing, you would be freaking out. The same thing applies in family law or just generally with law. And you know, having been involved with lawyers and even our own matters, it drives me crazy when I don't hear from my lawyer. If you want to avoid the number one complaint, that's how you do it. Over communicate, keep them advised. Keep good notes, communication. Diligence, which was a little surprise, but you don't necessarily, you do get some of these complaints in family law that you're not pushing the case forward, but 4-1.3, a 
A lawyer shall act with reasonable diligence and promptness in representing a client. I think you see a lot of that in PI work, where sometimes the, the length of time it takes to get there uh, and for things to, to move forward happens like that, especially in federal court. If you ever had a case in federal court that takes forever. When I practiced in federal court 20 years ago, I did my free case. It, it, it lasted for three years. It was crazy, but diligence. Number three, a misleading, when I read that, safekeeping property, 4-1.15. I thought, I mean, am I getting possession of a client's you know, property? Am I not keeping it? Am I not forwarding it? What is that? So let's read it real easy. A lawyer shall hold property of clients or third persons that is in a lawyer's possession in connection with a representation separate from the lawyer's own property. Basically, client trust accounts. They could just say trust account, make much more sense to me, but there it is. So even though we only had about 98, I think was the number, of investigations or issues dealing with safeguarding property, trust account, client money, it's number three on the number one, or on the complaints list of top 10 violations. Excessive fees, does that surprise anyone? It doesn't mean everyone thinks that divorce should be cheap when they call you three times a week and you're your, their personal counselor, it adds up. You tell the client, look, a psychotherapist is cheaper than I am, I'll recommend one. But they don't do it. But excessive fees, not a surprise. Dishonesty, fraud, deceit, misrepresentation, sad that that's number five. But you're going to see some examples of that. You would hope we don't see that. I mean, you can understand maybe mistakes regarding communication and diligence maybe even accidentally commingling, you know, or not transferring appropriately, but sad number five is dishonesty and fraud. Improper withdrawal, that was really surprising. I think most of that, and we won't, I don't think we have any cases on that today, right? Um, but that has to do with withdrawing so close to trial to the point where it's a detriment to the client. There's some appellate case decisions on that that I would encourage you to go find and read about withdrawal timing, how you should do it, uh, when you should do it, if you need to do it. And this, I think, tip, uh, typically are withdrawals without cause, meaning not a client conflict. It's more of, guy's not paying me. I, I don't want to do this for free. Some of the appellate cases you see that they just withdraw with no reasonable basis on the eve of trial or on the day of trial, and they leave the client in a bind. Conflicts, conflict check, conflict check. We just had a meeting yesterday in my office talking about, again, a conflict check process, making sure we're finding any open areas where we may be missing conflicts. You know, somebody may just randomly call your phone and want to talk to you and do a consult. You should be doing a conflict check first, period, to avoid any chances that there's any conflicts. Competence, we're going to talk about competence. That's huge, and I've got a good story about that that involves me on competence when I was a lawyer for about two days. Uh, truth to tribunal, again, shocking, but we've got one on that. Confidentiality, which I thought that would be much higher on the list, but it was number 10. All right. So top area is, what's the number one area for complaints? Family law, domestic. We are ripe for it. It's already an emotional subject matter. They're angry, and they become angry at you, they blame you. I'm filing a complaint because I lost a trial. Or their friend told them they, they could have done better. So they're filing a complaint against you. It just is the nature of our business. So what you take away from our ethics today, and what we started about, gosh, 23, 24 years ago, I sat down and we started talking about ways to develop processes in your firm that can prepare you for the client that is unreasonable and files a bar complaint. Being prepared knowing what you can do, the communication. I remember one time, 20 plus, 24 years ago, walked in, we had developed these processes, they're defensive in nature, but they're also very client-centric, client customer service centric. Walked in, fully organized, I had a binder, responding to everything the client had said, all the communication tabbed, all of my notes tabbed, all of my phone calls, because I used to write time, if you remember, old enough, we used to write it on, they called chit sheets. Chit sheets, not chit sheets. Chit. And I included all that, and the bar was like, just stunned. They're like, okay, dismissed. It was that quick. That's the point. 
I always tell young lawyers, one day you're going to get a complaint. It's not going to be valid. It's going to crush you. You're going to panic. But the point is, if you have processes and procedures in place, it's all good. Because your intent is right, you're competent, you're diligent, you communicate, you do what you're supposed to do, prepare. So that's what I think the lessons learned, why we talk about ethics. It's not just to understand and feel sorry for the people that we're going to talk about, because I really feel badly for some of these people, but domestic. We're dealing with a really hot topic. So I'll turn it over to Dan to talk about what's left for the, uh, the game. All right, so when I was preparing this, I was talking with some of my colleagues and Scott, and we really wanted to try to make it fun, entertaining, as much as we can about ethics. As our partner said this morning, how do we make ethics fun? So what we wanted to do was look and see what cases are out there and what types of violations were there, and did the attorney get disbarred? Were they suspended? Uh, did they actually take what was offered? So we're going to go through uh, some cases. They're not hypotheticals. They're actual cases that really happened. And what I would like, uh, before we display what the offer was, I'm going to give you the facts, and then I'm going to ask you what you think the offer should be. And then I'll let you know what that attorney decided to do, whether it was take the offer or whether they were going to drop the ball, essentially, and, and play roulette spin that wheel and determine what do I get a better deal essentially and then I'm going to ask you what do you think happened and so if we can just get some audience participation that would uh, speed this up a little bit for you and then be interested to see what a lot of our fellow colleagues think so here's what we're gonna try to learn I chose cases from the the top 10 violations I didn't find some that I thought were humorous or interesting for all 10, but as we go through this, you'll, you'll pick up on, a, on some themes here. But what we want to go through is current conflicts, prohibited transactions, safekeeping property, candor towards tribunal, communication, and misconduct. So with that being said, I can feel the enthusiasm building here. <laughs> so let's Let's get this game started, right? Or as here we are in baseball season, let's play ball. All right. The first case, N. Ray Kent Nichols. Let me give you the facts here. An attorney slapped his client who was handcuffed and in jail. The slapping was caught on videotape and became part of a news report on a local TV station. I promise you, these are not hypotheticals, they're not made up facts. <laughs> And one more. I, you lost the over or the under. We bet on this earlier, but I was going to mess this up on the video. And I think you bet the under, which was less than a minute. <laughs> The Durango Jail, home to roughly 2,000 inmates accused of all different crimes. But in this case, one of the inmates says he was the victim of a crime, and it all happened inside these walls. He assaulted a 54-year-old cardio patient. Are you kidding me? This was the most horrible thing that you can imagine. Michael Moore is talking about this video captured by jail surveillance back in March. He's handcuffed with no way to defend himself. You can see Moore talking to his attorney. MCSO documents identify him as Kent Nicholas of Mesa. The two exchange words, and then this happens. I was hurt, I saw stars, and I couldn't believe that number one, he talked to me like that, and number two, that he assaulted me. We spoke to Moore over the phone from the state prison in Florence, where he's serving a five-year sentence. Moore says he wasn't happy with how Nicholas handled his case. After making a motion to fire him, Nicholas stopped by the Durango jail for a sit-down meeting, a meeting that did not go as planned. All right. So what rules 
do you think that Mr. Nicholas should have familiarized himself with? <laughs> Don't do criminal law. <laughs> Here we go. 8.4b and 8.4d. Okay. So this is where I want to get some thoughts. What do you think the offer should be? <laughs> I like that one. Any other uh, thoughts on what the offer should be? All right, we had, we had two good suggestions. So here we go. 90-day suspension. All right. Now, the, the big question becomes, what would you do? Would you take that 90-day suspension, or would you drop that ball, spin the wheel, and see if you can't get a better deal? That, that's a good question. As far as on the opinion, no. Take it? I heard that. Take it? Would, it, would anybody gamble against it? You would? We got one? All right. There, that's what ended up being the resolution. So I don't think he won. Come in, Mark. Hi, Mark. Sit down, son. I need a lawyer. What for? Protect my rights. Got nothing to hide. You don't need a lawyer. Drone Clifford wasn't really dead when you found him, was he, Mark? We know. You were in that car, Mark. You ever hear of obstruction of justice, Mark? If I don't answer your questions, I could go to jail. Maybe. You're right. You do need a lawyer. How many cases have you won? More than I lost. How much do you cost? How much you got? Did you attempt to interrogate my client uh, outside the presence of his mother? No. No. Definitely not. You boys attempted to interrogate a child outside the presence of his mother without her consent. And if I need anything from you boys, like the truth, well, I expect to get it. I want that kid in court and on the stand, Manana. You hear what I'm telling you? We're taking me to jail. Well done. You get anywhere near my plan again without my permission, I'm going to sue you and the FBI for civil rights violations. You're playing big league hardball here, Miss Love. we got to get our hands on that child before the mob does. Why should he talk if we can't protect him? You talk to the feds tomorrow, I'll kill you. Have we played enough games here? What did Roman tell you in that car? A man lies dead by his own hand, yet this boy remains silent. I wasn't in that car. No, he doesn't know anything. We need to talk to this child. We know more about your client's actions than you do. Sometimes being strong means asking for help. I don't know nothing. You've got three to start telling me the truth. I'm scared. All right, here we go. Round number two. I'm going to tell you the facts. An insurance company hired a lawyer to monitor a trial involving an insured. This attorney took his job a little too seriously, so much so that the jurors complained to the court that this attorney was creepy and seedy. <laughs> Immediately after the verdict, the jurors disclosed to the court that they believed that they had been stalked throughout the course of their jury service. The jurors identified their stalker as a man who had watched the trial in the public gallery, taking notes on his laptop computer. The court overturned a defense verdict due to the stalking actions of this attorney. So, what do you think well, actually, we'll back up. What, what rule violations do you think this attorney should have familiarized himself with? <clears throat> so 
So we got 8.4C, it is professional misconduct for a lawyer to engage in conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. And 8.4D, it is professional misconduct for a lawyer to engage in conduct that is prejudicial to the administration of justice. So the big question becomes, what do you think the offer should be? Any thoughts? Should he be disbarred? What did he do? I mean, what, what constitutes yeah. creepy and stalkerish? <laughs> that's, that's a good point. So do you think that there should be, the offer should be on a lesser degree of maybe just a, a written letter to him? Or? The way that people perceive you is not conduct meriting any sort of sanction. So I don't care the way that you're perceived. I care about what he did. Yeah. That that well, you, you may care if you're the defense attorney, though. So you're thinking maybe definitely not disbarment. Maybe you just had a creepy face and you're sitting in the gallery. <laughs> Good. Any other thoughts? So in, in looking at the, the facts, what he did was stared them down while they were in trial and then kind of followed real closely around them when they were on break. So I don't, does that help? Does that change your thought? It does? It changes your thought? So do you think maybe it should be more of a, uh, maybe along the lines of suspension? No. Like a letter of admonition. Okay. Any other thoughts? It could be perceived as that. The, the facts didn't use the word intimidation, but if you're staring somebody down, they could take that as intimidating, absolutely. All right. We had some good dialogue about this one. I'm going to tell you what the offer was. Public reprimand. So, you think? I don't know. Who here would take it? Yeah. Who here would gamble against it and see if they can get something better? Nobody? All right. He decided to gamble. I know. So the first one, he decided to gamble and it didn't really work out in his favor. So essentially, the house won. Now, in this action, he did, this attorney decided to gamble. What do you think happened? Who thinks he lost and, and had something more serious? One. Who thinks that he walked away from the table a winner? Okay. He did. So no disciplinary action was taken. But I did put this in here. While this may look like he bet and won, the articles describe his actions as creepy, seedy, and is forever out there on our web. <laughs> All right. We're just getting started, ladies and gentlemen. Round number three. Here we go. This is a good one. Let me read you the facts. A judge in open court told a public defender that he did not need his help to sit down and then invited the public defender to a fight in the back hallway. <laughs> the public defender accepted the invitation <laughs> to fisticuffs and, and the ensuing fight was caught audibly on the videotape. You're Mr. Runkles? Yes, sir. Two charges, assault and resisting. You have the public defender. Public defender, what do you want to do? Have they fought? They have. I'm not waving. <laughs> All right. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? I'm not waving. <laughs> you want to set up for trial, set up for trial. All right. If you want to set up for docket sounding, set up for docket sounding. I'm not waving in any case. 
This, this is an you emergency know, if created I had by a the rock, state. I would throw it at you right now. You know, this Stop is a, pissing me off. Just sit down. I'll take care of it. Yeah. I don't need your help. No, sit you down. know, I'm the public defender. I have a right to be here, and I have a right to stand I said, and represent sit down. my clients. If you want to fight, let's go out back, and I'll just be let's go. All right, um, your choices, considering there's probably going to be a changeover in personnel, are uh, setting it for trial. Shocker. Which would be uh, June 9th. At 8.30. Or if you were wanting to waive speedy, we would set it for July 15th. I would like to get it done as fast as possible. That doesn't help me. You want to set it for trial and see what happens? Yes. All right. Speedy trial, June 9th, 8.30. All right. That's all we got to do, sir. <laughs> Again, not paid actors. <laughs> so the rule violation, I'll just... I'll take the suspense away, probably not a surprise, right? It's professional misconduct for a lawyer to engage in conduct that is prejudicial to the administration of justice. Now, what we're all probably wanting to know, at least I'm interested in, what do you think the offer should be? For the, for the judge. Yeah, that's a good point, for the judge. Removal, disbarment, I'm hearing. Anything else? Suspension. Any other thoughts? Payments and fines. It's a good one. It's really will get somebody's attention. All right. Here it comes. 120 day suspension, a $50,000 fine, a public reprimand, and continued participation <laughs> at a mental health therapy program. <laughs> so, and, and that's a good question. I, 
I, I did this, we, we, we do what we call a Cordell College, and so we, we teach some of our newer and younger attorneys uh, throughout their, their journey with the firm, and I did this presentation for them, and that was a question that was asked as far as what happened to the attorney, if anything. Yeah, that, that, you know, I don't know. That's a, that's a good point, though. At least you would have thought I'd try to break it up. So nothing happened to the attorney. There was no action brought against the attorney. And in fact, the attorney testified against the judge. <laughs> so let me ask you this. If you were the judge... Would you, would you take that offer, and I'll, I'll repeat it again, 120-day suspension, $50,000 fine, public reprimand, and continued participation in a mental health therapy program, or do you decide to gamble? Spin the wheel? Who here would spin the wheel? Yeah. Who would take that offer? Right, and if we, time permitting, that's part of the presentation too, is to identify other issues, and that's that's definitely one of them. And the defendant chose a trial date within a week, right? So <laughs> there, there, there's a lot of issues that are, are are wrong with this situation. So here's what the the honorable Judge Murphy decided to do. Decided he gambled. What do you think happened? Do you think the result was worse than the offer? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Who, who here thinks the result was worse than the offer? Looks like the majority. Okay. Who here thinks that there was a fine? Yeah. Do you think it was more than the $50,000 fine? Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you what happened. I don't think you'll be too surprised on what happened with this result. Yeah. Removed from office. Shocking. Right. But nothing happened to his license, though? Pardon me? Nothing happened to his license, though? I don't know. Did he win or lose the <laughs> I'm thinking he might have won, at least based upon the audible. <laughs> Next round. Here we go. Let me tell you the facts. It's a little bit more involved in this one. An attorney drafted a will which he knew was improperly attested to. He had his own brother sign as an attesting witness when, in fact, his brother was not present. He then filed the will for probate knowing it was invalid. The attorney lied under oath and committed perjury regarding the signing of the will on three occasions. To make matters worse, in April of 1986, just to give you an idea of the age of this one, while he was on probation for perjury, the attorney committed retail theft by stealing $26 worth of merchandise from a Kmart store, <laughs> to which he did plead guilty. So the panel noted that this attorney has committed some immature acts, is what they stated. For example, just to give you a further idea of some of these actions the attorney did. After everything that just happened, he then decided that he would send anonymous letters to certain attorneys and obtain magazine and book subscriptions for members of the court commission who were investigating him. And to give you an idea of what these magazines and books were, I was told not to put it on a slide. <laughs> so that'll give you an idea. So the rule violations for this attorney were 3.3, a lawyer shall not knowingly make a false statement of fact or law to a tribunal or fail to correct a false statement of material fact or law previously made to the tribunal by the lawyer. And 8.4C, 
it is professional misconduct for a lawyer to engage in conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. What do you think the offer should be? I hear disbarment. Mental health? Yeah, we had a really good presentation on that earlier this morning. Any other thoughts on what the offer should be? Suspension? Okay. Three-year suspension. I'm hearing, I'm hearing a lot of take it on this side. Not, not many gamblers, I don't think. So if you were Mr. Herod, what would you do? Take it, I heard over here. Do you gamble? I mean, three years suspension, and that's, that's, that's a long time. <laughs> However old you want them to be. All right, I'll tell you what happened. Walked away, voluntarily disbarred. So, as I mentioned earlier, I did this presentation at one of our Cordell colleges, and the attorneys were very excited about the presentation and very interested in this case that they wanted to know well, what happened after that. And so I did, did some digging, and I'll just give you kind of a, a brief update as far as where our, our friend Mr. Herod stands and, and what happened subsequently to that. So I mentioned before that he stole $26 from Kmart and pled guilty, but then uh, he decided that he'd try to get his arrest records expunged a few years later, and the court denied that because uh, he had a prior felony perjury conviction, if you remember earlier in the facts. Then he decided, well, maybe law isn't for me, so I'm going to try a new field. Maybe I'll go into real estate. So what he did was a couple years later uh, determined that he himself was a licensed real estate broker, and then he ran an advertisement under the name Herod's Real Estate, indicating Bloomington Normal Multiple Listing and Peoria Multiple Listing when he was not a member of the Peoria and or Bloomington Multiple Listing Services. He, just, he doesn't learn. Or he's not, not a quick learner, right? So then he decided, all right, well, that's not working for me, so let me try another adventure. And so what does our friend do? He del I'm sorry? <laughs> frightening. No. <laughs> he decided that he was going to send a letter to the Lycan law firm advising that he was in potentially investigating that firm for libel, malice, wanting to get punitive damages and other civil rights torts stemming from a letter that that firm sent uh, supposedly to another attorney. Very vague, but he decided, well, maybe they'll just pay me some money and, and settle this quickly. Right, so then the, this was brought to the hearing panel's attention and they determined that we are not going to reinstate this attorney and we're going to stick with what the results were. A few years later, the attorney decided, oh, I think I'm gonna gamble again. And so fast forward to about five years later, he went in front of the board and the, and the board actually recommended that his petition for reinstatement be granted. However, the court decided that even though that was the recommendation, the court denied it and did not enroll him as an attorney to practice law in Illinois. So let's go a few, more, a few years later, he, he petitions the court again to try to get reinstated. So we're, we're about maybe 10, 15 years from the first incident. And at that time, the court decided that they would reinstate him. So it took about 15 years from the time that the original action commenced to when he got his license back. So what, we, what we've learned so far uh, throughout what some of the top violations were, what some of our uh, colleagues have unfortunately been in trouble with, and, and one of them is candor towards the, the tribunal. And so just so we're all familiar with what the actual rule is, 
it's it's four dash three point three, uh, which is candor towards the tribunal, and then a lawyer. And I'll, I'll spare from reading it all. I, I know everybody can see up on the screen, but some of the highlights here: uh, a lawyer shall not, as Scott pointed out earlier, it's not may, not could, it shall not knowingly make a false statement of fact, uh, fail to disclose, offer evidence that the lawyer knows to be false. A lawyer represents a client and, and who knows that a person intends to engage is engaging or has engaged in criminal or fraudulent conduct relating to the proceeding shall take reasonable remedial measures, including, if necessary, Disclosure to the tribunal. Continue to the, this continues to the conclusion of the proceeding. And as most of us are aware, in an ex parte proceeding, a lawyer shall inform the tribunal of all material facts known to the lawyer that will enable the tribunal to make an informed decision whether or not the facts are adverse. And I can't tell how many times when I've met with a potential client, they're coming in and they just want to give their side of the case. That's helpful, but it doesn't really help us prepare our defense for them. We need to know not just the good, but the bad, so we can adequately make sure that we're representing them and preparing the best defense possible. Even if the facts against them could be embarrassing or th that could hurt their case, but it is information that we as lawyers, we, we do need to know. Yes, your husband did show remarkable foresight in taking those pictures, and yes, absent a swimming pool, the presence of a pool man would appear to be suspicious. But madam, who is the real victim here? Let me suggest to you the following. Your husband, on a prior occasion, had slapped you, beat you. I think that word is not inappropriate. No, I... Let me finish, please. I'm not concerned with who slapped whom first. Your husband, who had beaten you repeatedly... No, please, he never... Repeatedly was at the time brandishing your firearm. It was his gun. And we'll get it back for you, trying in his rage to shoot an acquaintance, a friend of long standing. They never really cared for each other. And if not for your cool-headed intervention, his tantrum might have ended this schmo's life and ruined his own. As for the sexual indiscretion which he imagined took place, wasn't it in fact he who was sleeping with the pool man? No? Am I going too far here? Where is sexual? No. I don't. Sorry, I'm not on the ship. The point is that he acted upon an assumption which he cannot prove, and I take it you deny. Uh, well... Fine, I'll take the case. It's imperative that I meet with Oliver Olerud before we proceed any further so that I can massage the kinks out of our testimony. Do you really think we could put all this across? The truth is so self-evident to me, Mrs. Donnelly, that I'm sure that I'll be able to make it equally as transparent to any jury, should your husband decide to take it that far. We'll need to caucus again to draw up a picture of your husband's net worth, a map of enemy territory, so to speak. You said that he's a television producer? He has a soap opera, The Sands of Time. It's a silly show. Well, it'll be yours soon. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. thank you, yeah. Mr. Massey. Bye-bye. You have to admire him for taking those pictures. <laughs> so, of course, that's brought with a lot of uh, issues and violations. What, what do you think were some, some violations or issues in the way that he was meeting with this potential client? Maybe promising everything? How many times have you had a client come in that would say, I want full custody? Sure, sure, I'll get you that. No, we would never say that. Or I, I make a, a million dollars and, and she's unemployed. She's just been a stay-at-home mom. I don't think she deserves anything. We're, of course, we're not going to say, oh, well, definitely no maintenance here. We'll get you that. Don't worry about it. So it really starts in the, in the beginning in that initial meeting. And these are things that we try to educate and inculcate to our attorneys when we're meeting with potential or prospective clients to really set the expectations in the beginning and make sure that they're aware of what the risks are. We have to know what the facts are, but we need them to know how the law applies to that. And based upon our experience, uh, whether in front of a certain judge or a, a certain jurisdiction, what we think the, the likely outcome could be. 
but we would never want to guarantee anybody uh, a result. Uh, Scott and I sometimes would travel the country and do seminars, and one of the things that Scott says that's resonated with me since we've been doing this for several years is when you go to a doctor, you're not going to want to go to somebody that's going to guarantee you to live through surgery. No matter how minute the surgery is, you're, you're, you're going to walk out of there right away because you're going to question the competency of this doctor. Just like here, you're not going to tell a client you can guarantee them any result. You're setting yourself up for failure, and more importantly, you're setting the client up for failure. And then kind of going with the theme of the ethics here, you're promising them everything. You're really setting yourself up for a, a bar complaint. So let's play another round, if that's okay with everybody. Round number five. Here we go. Our friend Alberg. Let me tell you what the, the facts are in, in this case. An attorney began an attorney-client relationship with a woman to represent her in a divorce and then began a sexual relationship with that woman. But the attorney failed to secure financial terms of the attorney-client relationship. The attorney then sent a bill to the client. After the bill was received, you know where this is going, I think. The romance fizzled, and the woman won an accounting of her money in the trust account. While the attorney did provide an accounting, he omitted the money that he had borrowed from time to time. Mm. So here are some of the, the rules that this attorney should have known, but even more importantly, should have familiarized himself with. 1.7A2, a lawyer shall not represent a client if there is a concurrent conflict of interest, including if there is a significant risk that the representation will be adverse to the client by a personal interest of the lawyer. 1.8K, a lawyer shall not have sexual relations with a client unless a consensual sexual relationship existed between them when the client-lawyer relationship commenced. 1.15, safekeeping a client's money in a trust account. 3.3, a lawyer shall not knowingly make a false statement of fact or law to a tribunal or fail to correct a false statement of material fact or law previously made to the tribunal by the lawyer. We just got a couple more. This attorney is in a little bit of hot water here. 8.4b, it is professional misconduct for a lawyer to commit a criminal act that reflects adversely on the lawyer's fitness as a lawyer. 8.4c, it is professional misconduct for a lawyer to engage in conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. And then to round it out nicely here, we have 8.4D. It is professional misconduct for a lawyer to engage in conduct that is prejudicial to the administration of justice. So what do you think the offer should be in this case? Now we've heard some of the other offers in, in the other cases. Some of them were shocking, some of them were probably of no surprise. But in this case, what do you think the offer should be? I heard disbarment. Suspension. How long of a suspension? We're we talking a 90 day as we uh, saw earlier or a three year suspension. I heard what? Indefinite suspension. Any other thoughts on what the offer should be? Okay. Well, there's the offer. Two-year suspension. So now, the big question becomes for Mr. Alberg, do you take the two-year suspension or do you decide, ah, I think I'm going to gamble and maybe I'll get something better? Take it? How many here by a show of hands thinks he should take the, the two-year suspension? All right, it looks like a majority. Okay, now, what, what do you think happened? He spun, and what do you think the end result was? Disbarment. Any other thoughts? 
I heard charged. I know the suspense is killing everybody. It is me up here. It's a spard. Wow. So it looks like the majority of the room was right. Conflict of interest, always a interesting but yet difficult topic. See, we're going to get a lawyer that's tough, a lawyer that's savvy. Is someone going to step on his grandmother for us. <gasps> Mr. Green, uh, David Murphy would like to speak to you. He says it's urgent. Ooh, uh, put him on the speaker. This is an old college buddy. Might only take a second. Jeremy? Davey, I'm in the middle of a meeting. What's up? Well, listen, um, we need you to close a deal. Ooh, what kind of deal? A big deal, very big deal. Ooh, big deal. Go on. We're in, in, in Vegas at the Hilton. Uh, we met John Gage. Do you know who he is? Sure, I know who he is. He's a billionaire and a, uh, a major hound. He is? Mm-hmm. Go on. He offered us a million dollars. million dollars? For what? Your kidneys? For one night with Diane. What do you mean? One night? Like? Yes. Could you excuse me for a second? Uh, let me get this straight. Um, he offered you a million dollars for a night with your wife? As in your wife, Diana? And you agreed to it? I don't know what to say. I mean, how could you do something like that? How could you negotiate without me? Never negotiate without your lawyer. Never. For a woman like Diana, I could have gotten you at least two million. <laughs> Obviously, you don't want to get screwed and then screwed. Hey, stay, please. This is damage control. Two seconds. Co eat, eat cookies. No, this no, cookie's coming. You don't understand. We've heard enough. You're hired. You are. You're our man. We love your style. Oh, great. Thank you. Gladys, check the gentleman's schedules. Call me next week, Wednesday. Wednesday, good? Great. See you then. Okay. Thanks for coming. No, thank you. Thank no, you. thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, David, before we go any further, let's, um, let's get the moral issue out of the way. Don't leave that to us. No, I was referring to my fee. I, I get 5%. Any issues in that video that you just watched? What do you think were some potential violations or issues? Yes. Revealing client confidences, an illegal deal perhaps. Uh, what about the negotiating that was going on? Is there any issues with that? Maybe negotiating a good deal for one client, but uh, a bad deal for uh, another client. Uh, Scott touched on this earlier. Uh, safeguarding client property and information. Any other Violations that you can think of that you saw in that video? All right. So the rule for conflict of interest is 4-1.7. So a concurrent conflict of interest exists if the representation of one client will be directly adverse to another client or there is a significant risk that the representation of one or more clients will be materially limited by the lawyer's responsibilities to another client, a former client, or a third person, or by a personal interest of the lawyer. B, a lawyer may represent a client if the lawyer reasonably believes that the lawyer will be able to provide competent and diligent representation to each affected client. The representation is not prohibited by law. The representation does not involve the assertion of a claim by one client against another client represented by the lawyer in the same litigation or other proceeding before a tribunal. And each affected client gives informed consent confirmed in writing. I get to hear him, maybe not even polite last on this one. We're just going to move right on then. So loyalty and independent judgment are essential elements in a lawyer's relationship to a client. 
concurrent conflicts of interest can arise from the lawyer's responsibilities to another client, a former client, or a third person, or from the lawyer's own interest. Bear with us. We've got to go through some rules before we can play a few more games here, but I promise you it will be well worth it. So resolution of a conflict of interest problem under this rule requires the lawyer to do four things. One, clearly identify the client or clients. Two, determine whether a conflict of interest exists. Three, decide whether the representation may be undertaken despite the existence of a conflict, whether the conflict is consentable. And four, if so, consult with the clients affected under the rule and obtain their informed consent confirmed in writing. Now, there are some actions that we need to do before representation, uh, which we've been talking about, but a conflict could happen after representation. So before representation, as you can see, a, kind of, a, a conflict of interest may exist before representation is undertaken, in which event the representation must be declined unless the lawyer obtains the informed consent of each client under the conditions of Rule 4-1.7b. To determine whether a conflict of interest exists, a lawyer should adopt reasonable procedures appropriate for the size and type of firm in practice to determine in both litigation and non-litigation matters the persons and issues involved. Uh, for those of you that were here last year, uh, Erica Giddings and I did an ethics presentation and we uh, did the theme of developing an action plan. And so hopefully you took that to heart and developed what your action plan was and made that appropriate to the size of your firm and, and how you conduct your practice. So now we have after representation. If a conflict arises after representation has been undertaken, the lawyer ordinarily must withdraw from the representation unless the lawyer has obtained the informed consent of the client under the conditions of Rule 4-1.7b. The lawyer's own interest should not be permitted to have an adverse effect on representation of a client. So let me ask you a question. What if a, a client is related by blood or marriage? Is there a conflict there? Or could there be a conflict? Is there a risk? By show of hands, how many people think that there may be a risk? Pretty many. When lawyers representing different clients in the same matter or in substantially related matters are closely related by blood or marriage, there may be a significant risk that client confidences will be revealed and that the lawyer's family relationship will interfere with both loyalty and independent professional judgment. Okay, Whew. we made it through that part. Let's play a, a few more rounds if that's okay. All right. I like the enthusiasm. <laughs> Here we go. Round number six. In Ray Sutton. Let me give you the facts. Okay. This attorney had a couple charges against him. So the first one, during the course of a hearing, an attorney whispered to his own witness, who was the arresting officer, that the judge was acting like a cockroach. The comment was picked up on tape recording machine <laughs> that was used in the courtroom. That, that, that's one count that he was uh, brought from the bar on. The second one was he was arrested uh, for getting into a bar fight. And then the third one was he encountered road construction that limited the highway to just one lane. Rather than wait his turn, he tried to drive through the construction. When a road worker approached his car and waved a stop sign at him, he ignored her request and continued on, striking the stop sign. At which point he got out of his car, yelled at the road worker, and threw a full Pepsi bottle at her, striking her in the side. He then got in his car and drove through the road construction out of turn. 
And then, let's see, he was charged with the crimes of battery, which was a Class B misdemeanor, disorderly conduct, which was a Class C misdemeanor, and failure to stop at a traffic control device, a traffic infraction. And so the fourth, well, right, the fourth one that uh, there were some issues with, he submitted expense reimbursements to the county, which were duplicative, and failed to follow his own diversion program. So, with those facts in mind, there are a few rule violations for him. What rules do you think that this attorney should have familiarized himself with? The opinion cited five. All right, I'll tell you. 1.1, 1 .1, a lawyer shall provide competent representation to a client Competent representation requires the legal knowledge, skill, thoroughness, and preparation reasonably necessary for the representation. 3.3, .3, a lawyer should not knowingly make a false statement of fact or law to a tribunal or fail to correct the false statement of material fact or law previously made to the tribunal by the lawyer. Continuing on, 8.4b, it is professional misconduct for a lawyer to commit a criminal act that reflects adversely on the lawyer's fitness as a lawyer. We have 8.4C, it is professional misconduct for a lawyer to engage in conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. And then lastly, rounding out the violations, 8.4D, it is professional misconduct for a lawyer to engage in conduct that is prejudicial to the administration of justice. What do you think the offer should have been in, in this case? Disbarment, suspension, fines, those are kind of the themes of the, the cases that we've seen earlier. But this one's a little bit, bit different. Suspension and fines. Do you think maybe a $50,000 fine, like our uh, honorable or dishonorable Judge Murphy? No. But a fine, that, that, that's always gets somebody's attention. Any other thoughts on what the offer should be? Pardon me? Three-year suspension? It's a long one. We did have that one. Any other thoughts? Makes sense. Right, there you go. Restitution. Indefinite suspension. If you were Mr. Sutton, do you take that offer? Or do you decide to gamble? Let's, let's spin that wheel and see what happens. Spin it? Yeah. I, 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 how many by show of hands would spin the wheel? It, it makes sense in this case, at least, right? Even for those who don't gamble. Well, I'll tell you what he did. He's taken his chance. So remember, the offer was indefinite suspension. What, what do you think happened? Disbarred? Any other thoughts? Pardon me? He might have. Stay tuned. A fine? I know someone tossed out a fine. You think there was a fine? Yeah. Someone said anger management. Do you think that was part of it? All right. I know you're wanting to know. I do not want to keep you in any more suspense. Public censure. So he won. All right, here we go. Round number seven, N. Ray Mintz. Let me read you the facts here. Attorney lied to investigators about the death of his girlfriend. His girlfriend struggled with alcohol and had just successfully graduated from a treatment program. Shortly thereafter, the attorney went with his girlfriend to several drinking locations and consumed a lot of alcohol. And they woke up the next morning, 
he found her dead from a fall. He then decided to delete all text messages, all phone calls, all communication, social media, you name it, moved her car from a restaurant to her apartment, and lied to authorities about his activities the night before. He defended himself by saying he feared for what her family would do to him when they found out. There were a couple rule violations, which were 8.4b. It is professional misconduct for a lawyer to commit a criminal act that reflects adversely on the lawyer's fitness as a lawyer. And 8.4d, it is professional misconduct for a lawyer to engage in conduct that is prejudicial to the administration of justice. So here we go. The offer. What do you think the offer should be? Disbarment? Oh, man, we're getting a little bit tougher here <laughs> as the games go on. Okay, disbarment. Uh, I heard suspension. Okay. Anything else? A fine? Any type of therapy programs? No? Yes? Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. A lot of good thoughts. The offer was public reprimand. Let, let that sink in. So who, who by a show of hands would take this offer? I'm not going to even count. I think almost everybody, if not everybody, raised their hand. What do you think that Mr. Minch did? <laughs> he decided to gamble. Right? So remember, the offer was public reprimand. I guess he clearly didn't like it. Clearly didn't talk to anybody in this room. And what, what do you think happened? I heard disbarred. Yes, sir? Suspension? Any type of length? Three years? It's a long one. I heard indefinite over there. Any other thoughts? Therapy. Th therapy. Anything else? Well, let me ask you this, because this is an interesting that he actually decided to gamble. Do you think that he won? Or do you think that the, the house won? House. So by a show of hands, who thinks the house won? A lot of people. Okay. Well, let me, let me ask this. Who by a show of hands thinks that the attorney won? <laughs> I don't even think I see one hand, Scott. <laughs> All right. Here we go. And who, and who thought ethics could be so suspenseful and fun? There it is. Indefinite suspension. But it does get worse for him. Indefinite suspension was clearly as bad, one, that he's been brought in front of the Ethics Committee, two, the indefinite suspension. But He had to pay uh, a, a fine to the woman's mother of almost $300,000 in a separate lawsuit filed against him. Pardon me? Uh, you know, I, I don't have that. Right. That shocked me when I pulled that up. Because some of these I wanted to see what else happened, if anything, like our friend Mr. Herod. And so when I... When I pulled up this case, I was, I was actually shocked. But it doesn't end there, my friends. I promise. There's one, one more thing, as uh, Steve Jobs used to like to say. Reciprocation. 
He was licensed in Missouri, and so Missouri decided to do an indefinite suspension. This should be in your materials if you wanted to, to look this up, but there's the, the case number. I'm going to turn it over to Scott to go over some more rules, have a little bit more fun playing some games, and then I'll return. Sorry. No, you're good. All right. So if you remember the Mr. Herod, he wasn't uh, a real estate agent, but he did stay at a Holiday Inn Express. <laughs> So I thought that was funny. So let's, um, let's watch a clip of an attorney. We talk about competent representation of an attorney who's in over his head. Thank you. Now, Mr. Tipton, were you wearing the mat day? No. Yes, you see. <laughs> You were 50 feet away, you made a positive eyewitness identification, and, 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 and yet, you were not wearing your necessary prescription eyeglasses. they reading glasses. <laughs> uh, well, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, 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 could you tell the court what color eyes the, 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 the defendants have? Brown, mm. hazel green. No more questions. <laughs> Mr. Gambini, your witness. <sighs> He's a tough one. Yes. I'm going to end it there. It goes on, and, I, and there's a couple more, but I, we're running short. So that's my favorite line. Woo! He's a tough one. I mean, that, that is classic. So come on. Now, we know anyone not think he has some competence issues? So the thing is, what are we talking about with competence? I mean, that word is a little tricky. So we're talking about trial competence, subject matter competence, and legal experience competence. Those are my words. Those, that's not, that's what I'm, as I think about that rule, uh, that's what I'm thinking about. So think about it. My guess is he's probably not very good at trial. Uh, he, he's probably not done a criminal trial, or not very often. And he doesn't have that much legal experience in terms of cross-exam. I mean, because he did the one thing that asked a question he didn't know the answer to already, and he got blown out of the water. Right, so competence. So rule 4-1.1 says a lawyer shall provide competent representation to a client. Competent representation requires, and this is what we'll talk quickly about, the legal knowledge, so you'll want to underline that. Skill, underline that. Thoroughness, thoroughness and preparation reasonably necessary for the representation. So my guess is, if you look, think about that clip, he, he did zero preparation. He didn't do a deposition. He had no idea that this guy only wore reading glasses. He just saw that there were reading glasses. And he had no idea what the witness was going to say. And then, of course, he didn't know what his vision was like, and he asked about the color of their eyes, and boom, just like that, he knew exactly the color. So I think that's a, a classic example of confidence, or confidence. So we talk about the relevant factors, and that is, you want to think about the complexity and the specialized skill or the nature of the case that you're doing, the lawyer's general experience, the lawyer's training in the field. Like, for example, would you handle a work comp case if you've never done one, or a patent case, or a merger and acquisition? Your best friend says, hey, I'm going to buy um, AT&T. Will you help me do this? No way. I mean, we all get calls. My wife's famous for saying, how oh, can you help my friend out? You know, and it's some issue I, I don't know anything about. And she goes, well, you're a lawyer. And that's a classic example. And people think you know it all because you went to law school. Well, I don't. I don't know it at all. And I don't want to know it at all. I, I, it's, it's crazy. So that's why I think the training experience. Let me tell you quickly, I mentioned early on about competence and my example. 
So I, I tell this story all the time, and it is funny, I look back on it. I, I graduated, got my degree, whatever, got my license, and my first boss, who's not in here, thankfully, I was a prosecutor. And uh, I, it was a Monday. I think I got my license sworn in that Friday. Um, he goes, hey, will you go to the docket? And I remember it was Judge Everwine in the county. And I said, sure, I'll go answer the docket. And it was just a simple traffic docket for, for this. And so I thought, no big deal. What am I going to say? You know, just going to continue the case, let them know status. And they call the case. And the judge looks at me and goes, you ready? And I said, for what? <laughs> and he said, we're going to panel a jury in 45 minutes. And I, uh, and I know, now I know, my boss is in, you know, at the door, peering in, laughing so hard because I am freaking out, right? So <laughs> I didn't know what to do. Back then, and I'm, I'm not that old, but this is a while ago, so I rush, they call a recess, I go back to the clerk's office, and I start typing up jury instructions, and on a real typewriter, because we didn't, they didn't have the computers in their, their uh, clerk's office. Luckily, competence. I just come off of really good trial ad. Uh, I had an advanced jury instruction and jury selection class that I had just taken, an advanced seminar. So I felt really comfortable. I'm freaking out, but I mean, I'm good, right? And so I get the jury instructions done. It's a simple traffic case. It really, I swear, it was speeding and no proof of insurance on a pro se defendant who was insistent on having a jury trial. And so that's why you sent me. Not much damage I can do. And so I remember uh, I looked at the clerk, and the jury, <laughs> the pool's coming in, and I said, can I just take the first 12? And she's like, no. And I go, oh, I gotta go through this. So anyway, I did it. I tried the case. And they were out for 45 minutes, and of course I won, which is great, right? So competence. So if you go back, my general experience, I didn't, I didn't have a lot, but I definitely had training on jury selection. I had training on jury instructions, and I had really good training on, on moot trial or moot court. And so my boss knew that, and it's one of the reasons I, I felt really comfortable in the courtroom as a one-day lawyer. And I always tell that story and uh, got the victory. So that was my funny, funny prosecutor story. So preparation and study, the lawyer's able to give the matter. Uh, that's another one you wanna talk about in competence and whether it's feasible to relate or refer the matter to or consult with another lawyer who's established in the field. So look, in, in my case, I had talked through generally what, what you do as a prosecutor and the steps you go through and I knew how to try the case and, uh, but it is funny when, you know, it's your kind of trial by fire, and uh, it's a good story. So a lawyer need not necessarily have special training, I didn't, or prior experience to handle legal problems of a type with which they are unfamiliar. A newly admitted lawyer can be as competent as a practitioner with long experience. And I, I mean, I think I did an awesome job. I'm sure the jury knew I had no idea that I had not been trying many cases but that's the point. It doesn't matter if you've been out 30 years or 30 minutes. Depends on your background, what your training has been, your comfortability with it, and realistic comfortability. So thoroughness and preparation. We talk about competent handling of a particular matter. It includes inquiry into an analysis of the factual and legal elements of the problem and the use of methods and procedures meeting those standards. So I will skip the rest. But that's the point is, when you get something and you get that pit in your stomach like you don't know and maybe you shouldn't take it, don't take it. Maintaining competence, big one. So to maintain the requisite knowledge and skill, a lawyer should keep abreast of changes in the law, what you're all doing here today. But I will question your competence because it's beautiful outside and we should be outside. Associated with all things like technology, Continuing study, I look at, and something I've done for 15 plus years, is read the slip opinions that come out from the appellate courts, all of them. And I just don't focus on family law. I read every one of them. Because I think there's relevance, and I've used some of the arguments in many cases that are in family law. I can tell you there are such great nuggets of information that come out of civil cases and criminal cases just the idea of the, the theory of thinking as the courts go through to reach the conclusion, because I love doing appellate cases. 
And so I, I get an understanding of what they want to hear. But that will be the best 20, 30 minutes of your time on Tuesdays, is pull up the slip opinions from all of the appellate uh, districts. Uh, retaining or contracting with others. So uh, I used to also actively practice in Illinois. And at one point early in my career, I did um, defense work on uh, uh, big companies and what would be employer liability. And I did bench and jury trials. And I had a big case in Illinois, went to verdict, and they, they, uh, they appealed it. And I, if you know Illinois, and I, my office was in the county, you really want to get co-counsel in Illinois because you, it's just the way it is. And there are some counties in Missouri similarly. So I retained co-counsel in Illinois to take the lead on the appeal because I didn't feel comfortable uh, in the 5th District in Illinois, if you know anything about it. You just need to be in Illinois. Trust me, still rules probably to the day. So anybody else been co-counsel or asked to be co-counsel on cases? I mean, I get uncomfortable as second chair or co-counsel. In fact, I won't do it. I want to be the lead because I don't, I want to be able, if I'm liable as co-counsel, I want to be able to make decisions. But that's why I gave full authority uh, on this appeal to co-counsel to make the decisions on the appeal. The client was good with it. And it's about ex explaining to the client why, being very clear in written form why you're doing it. It's not that you lack experience, it's that you need the advantage. But I would uh, not hesitate to do something you know, in a uh, small county in southern Missouri, Reynolds County, I, I've done that before, where you can get some local counsel because they expect it. You don't want to be the big city lawyer coming in. Keep going through, sorry. I just want to speed it up. So, oops. I think this rule applies. 4-7.1. A lawyer shall not make a false or misleading communication about the lawyer or the lawyer's services, right? And that includes your experience level and your identity, right? It's funny, when I think about that, you can also talk about a communication is false if it contains a material misrepresentation of fact or law. That isn't just your spoken word, but it could be uh, your web page. It could be advertisements. I saw some billboards and I wrote them down. Just because you did it doesn't mean you're guilty. That was a lawyer's billboard. Interesting. Killed or injured, over $150 million collected. There were no disclaimers. Kind of implying they're going to get you $150 million, a lot of money. Here's my favorite. 
It was a picture of this lawyer. She was on the big, big picture and said, LA's dopest attorney. <laughs> Harvard Law and affordable. I don't know about dopest, so that may be a little problem for her. So a communication is misleading if it omits a fact as a result of which the statement considered is wholly, uh, or as a whole is materially misleading, is likely to create an unjustified expectation about results the lawyer can achieve. An uh, example of that is uh, asking how many trials have you won and how many have you lost. I, uh, I was in a lawyer's office many, many years ago uh, and behind his desk it said victories and it was like one of those, and you could change the number over and over and there was nothing about losses, only victories. I think it's misleading. I think that creates an unjustified expectation. You just have to be careful. I mean, these things are so obvious to so many of us, but it's worthy of going through. Uh, proclaims results obtained on behalf of clients, such as the amount of the damage award, the $150 million, or their record in obtaining favorable verdicts without stating that past results afford no guarantees. Uh, I, I like watching or looking at ads for lawyers. There's so many that don't follow the rules. They don't put the disclaimers. Uh, and they're, they violate this rule all the time. All right, I'm going to skip through just to keep moving. Round eight. So we'll all go to the roulette wheel. And this is in Ray Joe Caramagno. And I have to, before we watch the video, this is a real video. This judge had amazing, um, just did an amazing job of holding back on this guy. So let me tell you the facts before we watch the video. Las Vegas attorney who was representing a client facing life in prison on kidnapping charges. Pretty serious, right? The attorney shows up for trial, drunk. Begins to argue, you'll see, about He's not really drunk, he's in an accident. But I, you know, have a head injury history. I've played professional hockey. It just goes on and on, but I'm ready, judge. I'm ready to go, you know, slurring a little bit. So I call this video, happy hour at trial or lawyers and liquor. The record will reflect that this hearing is taking place outside the presence of the jury panel. Defendant is here. He's in custody. Um, Mr. Caramango, I want to address you first because it's my understanding you might have some problems this morning. Judge, I was heading uh, east on Sahara Drive and I was rear-ended and my car was undrivable. A good Samaritan drove me to the courthouse. Who? I, Just someone picked you up and drove you here? A good Samaritan, who's a Las Vegas local, drove me to the courthouse, and his name is Chris, and uh, I apologize, Your Honor, I left my house at 9 o'clock this morning, and I was rear-ended, the person who hit me took off, and... Uh, hit and run? It was a hit and run, Your Honor. So you called the police, obviously. I did not, Your Honor. I'm not in favor of dialing 911. So... Even when you're the victim of a hit and run? Philosophically, Judge, I never call the police. Because? My car is on Rancho, west of Sahara, with the, with the flashers on, which with much wide damage. It's a 2006 Audi, and uh, here I am. And I, I asked my office to call the court to let them know it's going to be late. No, we did get that phone call. I apologize, Your Honor. So I'm just a little concerned. So your car is just there on Rancho, west of Sahara, in the what? What in the, in a lane? Did you pull? It's in a turning lane, Judge. Someone someone was kind enough to pull up and push me into the turning lane, and uh, it's it's there as we speak.
And the person that rear ended you went around you and took off? Yes, ma'am. No license, nothing? <laughs> I didn't get it, Your Honor. It's a pretty hard hit, and... Right, because you don't look... I'm going to tell you, be honest with you, you don't look right this morning. That's why I'm concerned. Judge, my neck and my back is killing me. And, but I'm ready to go forward. <laughs> You don't think you need medical attention? Um, I think I do. I think I do, Your Honor. What? Okay, well, how about I have the courthouse nurse at least come up and take a look at you? Judge, you I'm, I'm, I'm willing to play her. Pardon? I'm willing to play her. Well, that's the only problem with that is that sometimes that creates problems in trials. I understand, Your Honor. I'm not willing to play hurt. I want to be a hundred percent because that's not I, I fair to you, well, yeah. and it's not fair to your client if you're not a hundred percent. And I'm telling you, my observations of you are. Not... I may have suffered a concussion, Mom. <laughs> and for sure, if you think you hit your head, Judge, I know I, I know I had a serious whiplash, and the driver that hit me took off, but I feel. I feel like I'm able to go forward. And you feel like you suffered a concussion? Yes, Your Honor. Because you hit your head? Just because of the whiplash, Your Honor. I've had multiple concussions before, and I feel like I may have suffered another concussion. You've had multiple concussions? Yes, Your Honor. I played, I played professional ice hockey and I also oh. played college football. Okay, so you know so what I'm, it feels like. Yeah, I've my head has been the subject of many severe contacts. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna end it. It goes on, and he just the story keeps building. You know, I give a seminar. I talk about the one chip theory. If you're old enough to remember Lay's chips, used to have a commercial. You just can't eat one. Because it's like lies. You can't, the one needs two, a four, eight, 16 lies to keep building. And so all he did, he just kept making the story so much bigger. And eventually the judge, you know, after a long time, judge said, look, we're doing a breathalyzer. And he blew 0 0.075. So by the time he did, he, of course, he was under the limit, but it had been a long time uh, that they went back and forth and bantered over this ridiculous, you know, just these slow motions he's doing. And she was so good with him, which is surprising. So the offer from the bar, one year suspension, probated enrollment in drug counseling. Right? Because you keep your license. That's what's at issue. So what does he do? Right? He walked away from the table because he, you know, probably drinking, thinking he can do better. Voluntary disability, inactive status with no reinstatement. Done. So he went from having his livelihood to having nothing because he tried to play the odds and the odds weren't in his favor. He spun the wheel. Basically, it's, it's a permanent suspension, no application for reinstatement. Round nine. In Ray Diaco Law Firm, you can, I Googled this because I wanted more information about this. And it was a case against Bubba the Love Sponge. He's a disc jockey. And so this is a, and it, gosh, it's so odd. So I had to pull the full thing just to read some of the facts. So these three attorneys who represented Bubba the Love Sponge in a defamation case against him uh, conspired to get the plaintiff's lawyer arrested for DUI. And so they, they put this elaborate scheme together. They involved their paralegal to go flirt with him at a bar. They called a friend who was in the Tampa Police Department and said, we know this guy, he drinks all the time, and he drives drunk. And we need you, you know, I think it's for public safety, you need to be staking out this bar. So he goes the first time and nothing happens, he doesn't show. The second time the plaintiff's lawyer shows, it's on the eve of trial, and he brings his briefcase with him, which I find interesting that that's the facts in the case, because I think what the defense wanted was to get the briefcase. It's got all kinds of stuff in it. But anyway, that paralegal flirts with him, gets him drunk, she says, oh, I parked my car, but I can leave it here because they, of course, 
She gets him to go to her apartment. And on the way, as they're walking out, he, they eventually convince, he convinces her to drive. He drives two miles away. They pull him over for DUI. Somehow, this, this whole story is, they figure out it's a conspiracy uh, because of the way the story from the legal assistant doesn't add up. They look at records, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they figure out what's going on. They wanted him off the case because they felt like it would be a bigger advantage to their case to win a defamation action if the plaintiff's lawyer was out. So rule violations, all kinds, right? You can imagine. It's professional misconduct for a lawyer to engage in conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. It's pretty obvious. Misconduct to engage in conduct that is prejudicial to the administration of justice. So they actually went to court for trial that next morning, and they said, we'd like to proceed, we're ready. And they were trying to get the court to move with a much younger associate that was on the case, and they were going to go. The funny story is, they wound up winning the defama defamation case anyway on the defense side. They didn't need it. So the offer for these three, a sternly worded public reprimand. To me, that's easy. You take it. But if you kind of think about it and you read the background of these three lawyers, you know what they did, right? They let it ride. Permanent disbarment. Crazy. Now, bear with me. We're over time, but I'm going to use about five or ten minutes. We'll just skip your second half. Is that cool? Okay. just want to get through at least so we get our full ethics plus some. Here's an article. You look through it. The, I mean, the Supreme Court justices were just read the, their, their words and their, their opinion from the bench, just crush these lawyers for their, I mean, they were so, they were smirking and they just thought they were going to get away with it. They really thought nothing was going to happen, that the public reprimand would go away. Round 10. This is one of my favorites. Svetlana Sangare. So Svetlana get here, had a website for herself and decided to put a bunch of photos on there. And they were, you know, they looked like normal photos um, of herself with celebrities, Barack Obama, Pre uh, Vice President Biden, George Clooney. Uh, you'll see here some of Let's go through what happened, though. So it turns out that she photoshopped herself in every one of those photos. She claimed on her website she was the lawyer for the stars, that she was a high, uh, politically connected, that she was a high campaign contributor, that, you know, big donor to Barack Obama. And what was uncovered, which was funny, she had donated $3 to Barack Obama. <laughs> so here's the violations. A lawyer shall not make a false or misleading communication about their services. A professional to engage in conduct involving dishonesty and prejudicial to the administration of justice. Here's some of the photos. Pretty good. So if you, can, you can't really see very well on here, but it's, uh, I mean, everyone, every star you can imagine in LA, right? Today it is a California lawyer who tried to drum up business by showing photos of herself with famous celebrities, except they were fake. Svetlana Sangari may have her law license suspended after she was caught using Photoshop pictures of herself with politicians and stars. The mocked up photos appeared on her professional website leading potential clients to think she knew the celebrity. She didn't. Take a look. Here she is with President Obama, Kim Kardashian, and the Clintons. The list goes on and on. I think I might do that. In total, about 50 bogus photos were posted. Now, a state judge overseeing a disciplinary hearing is proposing to suspend her license six months for allegedly confusing, deceiving, and misleading the public. Further, Sangari was told two years ago to remove the photos. In a response to the court's accusation, she calls herself a prominent political donor and philanthropist that's based on an email from the Obama campaign asking her for an additional $3 donation. And so, Slitlana Sangari for practicing law and a bit of chutzpah is our favorite person of the day. So her offer was a public reprimand and they said, just remove the pictures. <laughs> yeah, but you gotta know who you're dealing with, right? 
So what does she do? She says, no, I'm not taking the pictures down. This part. <laughs> so here's the bright side for Svetlana. She's now a very professional Photoshopper. <laughs> so <laughs> let me see here. I was going to find some more. So at the end of the day, it is, and I'm going to end here so we can stay and we take a break. It's, it's about knowing and understanding realistically what is good and what is bad and what the odds are that you're going to do far worse. I mean, every one of these, some of them, like the $50,000 fine, I think in that case stood out to me as a lot of money to that judge. Uh, it seemed a little bit arbitrary and that was reversed, but choose your battles. But goodness, I, I, I've had uh, cases where I've seen people decide to, to spin the wheel. All they had to do is repay this loan of $10,000, and they were and they were convinced they didn't have to do it, disbarred. Kansas, Missouri, just crazy. So read up, competency, deceit, dishonesty, just read those rules, read the top five, and you'll be good to go. All right, we'll take a 10-minute break, and we'll start back up. <laughs>